my pleasure again to continue the presentations of the new World Health Organization classification of head and neck tumors from the fifth edition. And as you can tell, I'm going to cover a bit of a potpourri of the various um, entities within this anatomic site uh, of oral cavity, oropharynx, odontogenic, melanoma, germ cell tumors, metastases, and tumor syndromes. Again, I do have royalties from books, and as a compliance disclosure, I'm both a standing member of the editorial board for the WHO as well as an expert member for this particular book. So let's talk about the oral cavity for a few moments. Um, as you can tell from the 2005 edition, there were 58 different diagnoses that were included. That has been now reduced uh, for the 2017 to 26 and now down to 16 diagnoses for this edition. Much of this, as you know, is related to the fact that uh, duplication for soft tissue, bone, uh, hematolymphoid lesions have been taken out and therefore this creates um, a much more easy overall approach. The new entities for this particular edition are actually the non-neoplastic ones. So when one thinks about the tumor-like lesions or uh, reactions that can be seen, necrotizing salametoplasia, multifocal epithelial hyperplasia or hex disease, as well as our oral melanoacanthoma are all lesions that can simulate uh, neoplasms and therefore were included for the sake of completeness. There have been some changes in the oral potentially malignant disorders and the oral epithelial um, entity, dysplasia entities, specifically as it relates to architecture and cytology. And then of course, submucosal um, fibrosis, HPV associated dysplasia, Verrucous carcinoma and carcinoma cuniculatum all had significant changes for this edition and the update for ectomesenchymal chondromyxoid tumor, specifically as it relates to the now recognized uh, gene fusion. So let's start out with oral melanoacanthoma. This is a non-neoplastic process, but it's characterized by this proliferation of both the epithelium as well as uh, dendritic melanocytes that has a very, very rapid clinical onset, even though it is a real, uh, indolent behavior. And so here you can see such a lesion immediately adjacent to the tooth um, as it goes into the gingiva. And it is a remarkable increase in rapid size um, over a very short time. There's usually a dendritic uh, melanocytic proliferation that extends all the way up into the upper reaches of the um, epithelium that is associated with some spongiosis as well. But of course, there is no nested pattern. There's no uh, atypia. And of course, it does not extend down into the underlying stromal component either. Usually, there's some sort of deposition of melanin present at the basal layer, as you can see in the histology image. Submucous fibrosis. Um, is a chronic and insidious disease characterized by this progressive uh, deposition of fibrous connective tissue in the submucosal tissues of the oral cavity and oropharynx that has a risk of transformation to squamous cell carcinoma. So you can tell here in the oral cavity, there are clearly other things going on as well, since there's frequently um, tobacco use, uh, betel nut chewing, et cetera, that is also seen concurrently with submucous fibrosis. The early changes tend to have a very minimal uh, increase in vascularity, inflammatory infiltrate, and some fibrillar collagen, while later on it becomes a bit more homogeneous, starting immediately underneath the epithelium, as you can see highlighted by the arrow in the lower panel. As it advances, um, it finally gets to a complete loss of vascularity with hyalinized collagen deposition and dense fibrous connective tissue. So this is one of the new entities that is associated with an increased risk of the development of squamous cell carcinoma. As you know, the HPV-associated dysplasia is a very characteristic histologic appearance in the oral cavity, not in the oropharynx, where there's a karyorexis or dyskeratotic appearance to many of the cells, um, where the entire thickness of the epithelium is completely disorganized and lacking maturation as it goes to the surface. And of course, this has a very strong association with HPV, whether documented by P16 or one of the in situ hybridization uh, methods to high risk HPV. So it is a very specific finding. Uh, this is not recommended again that every single dysplastic lesion of the oral cavity have a P16 or high risk HPV tested, but it is in this very specific and unique setting in which that additional testing can be performed. Baruchus carcinoma and carcinoma cuniculatum both had a significant 
um, increase and improvement in uh, the nomenclature for them and the classification of them. And I can tell you that carcinoma cuniculatum, when you look at it like this on low power and a resection specimen, is absolutely fantastic and classical because you can see all of these burrows and furrows, if you want to call of them. Uh, war uh, rabbit warren is sometimes used as uh, the colloquial description for this, where you can see that there is this very, very convoluted overall appearance. However, I can tell you that in general, you're going to get a biopsy that comes through just this superficial surface over here, and it may look like pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia or an atypical squamous proliferative lesion that doesn't otherwise allow you to reach the correct interpretation. So just be aware that many times carcinoma cuniculatum is one of those cases where the clinical pathologic correlation between what is being seen clinically and what you're receiving histologically must be done in order to be able to uh, address the diagnosis correctly. So this is an idealized case. Um, and I know when Susan Mueller was submitting it, she was like, oh, this is the best case I've ever had of this particular diagnosis. And it really is um, quite classic for the lesion. In the oropharynx, as you know, in the 2005 edition, uh, nothing was included at all. So it was still part of the oral cavity in that setting. And yet in the 2017 fourth edition, um, 11 diagnoses were given in that site and it was separated out from the oral cavity. And now we've gone down to just three diagnoses, specifically as it relates to the hamartomatous polyps or lymphangiomatous polyps as one of the uh, benign reactive or hamartomatous lesions. And then updating the entities of HPV associated squamous cell carcinoma versus HPV independent squamous cell carcinoma. So initially uh, the term HPV unrelated had been used and that just sounded very awkward, but HPV independent is now the classification used for this tumor entity. So if you think about um, hamartomatous polyps, again, these are lesions that are associated with a palatine tonsil, specifically a haphazard proliferation of elements that are normally found in the oropharynx and um, associated with a uh, lymphangiomatous appearance, which is the number one uh, group of this particular lesion. There are multiple different area uh, lesion types that can give you hamartomatous polyps, but the lymphangiomatous one is the most frequently seen. Uh, generally, younger age at initial presentation without any sex difference. So I think you can tell from the histology down in the lower corner here that there's an abundant uh, lymphoid infiltrate with these very dilated vascular uh, channels that are part of the lymphangiomatous geometrist appearance for this lesion. This is just an example of normal tonsillar epithelium, and I bring it up specifically to be able to say I would like one of you to tell me where the uh, tonsillar epithelium begins and where it ends and where the lymphoid component starts and stops. And you can tell it is an incredibly intimate relationship. Here is another area of a different uh, case, just to highlight again that there is no evidence of a basement membrane. And it is for this reason that the idea and concept of an in situ lesion for oropharynx is kind of um, negated because you can't ever really tell when it has invaded beyond the basement membrane when there is not one. So here is an example of a tonsillar resection. I, I'm actually going to drive this case for you, and I hope that you'll be able to see it here. Um, and I think that you can tell from this area uh, that you know there is normal tonsillar epithelium. It has a very nice uh, lymphoid component. The uh, epithelial elements, as you see them over here, have that same you know juxtaposition of the lymphoid and epithelial component immediately adjacent one to another. And so you may say, um, where is actually the tumor in this? And lo and behold, if this is not the tumor here. Now, what I'd like to do, because you know we can do this with the measurement tool, is if I measure from there to there as the overall dimension of this lesion, you can see that in fact, this tumor is less than 2.5 millimeters as a total diameter for it. I'll go up to um, higher power just so you can see the architectural features of this, but this is merely to highlight that this is the type of tumor that actually presented with evidence of lymph node disease. And therefore it is often very, very difficult to be able to highlight the primary tumor in the oropharynx when you're looking at it radiographically. Here is an example of such a lesion uh, deep in the uh, tonsillar crypts and in the uh, deep lymphoepithelium. And in fact, when you do a P16, you can see how the neoplastic cells are strongly and diffusely reactive with greater than 70% of the nuclei and cytoplasm giving you a strong block-like reactivity, while the overlying surface epithelium is completely uninvolved in this example. 
So as I already suggested in the previous lecture, there are these very fantastic data sets that are utilized for them that allow for a standardized reporting by the International Collaboration on Cancer Reporting or ICCR. And with that, there are accompanying um, explanations and recommendations of the guidelines. These have been published in the Archives of Pathology and Lab Medicine for the entire data set group. And so when you look at the uh, histology reporting guide, you can tell that there's a very standardized approach to what information is being reported, such that from each different uh, organization or even across ge geographic areas, you're able to now come up with the exact same terminology. Likewise, the WHO classification system has been reproduced in these so that they match exactly what is going on with the new classification of the book. I think it is important to mention that HPV-associated neuroendocrine carcinoma is one of the entities uh, specifically recognized as a tumor subtype. As you will see here, there's a very strong synaptophysin reactivity in the neoplastic cells that are also strongly and diffusely reactive with um, P16. And I'm going to talk about um, this a little bit more later on, but I think you are well aware that the um, HPV associated finding in the oral pharynx is certainly something that can be seen with neuroendocrine carcinomas. So um, let's put our love aside for oropharyngeal uh, lesions and go on to the next category, which is the odontogenic and maxillofacial. You can tell that uh, the number of entities keeps expanding every year um, as we go through the various editions, and now we're up to 55 different diagnoses. So this is clearly one of the larger chapters in the overall book. Some of the new entities were the odontogenic cysts related to surgical ciliated cysts. Um, adenoid ameloblastoma was one of the epithelial odontogenic lesions added. And then there was a significant change in the fibrosseous lesion dysplasia category as to how they were going to be classified and in which section they were going to be placed. One of the new entities was included as a malignant jaw tumor with the TFCP2 rearranged rhabdomyosarcoma, which I'm going to discuss in a little bit more detail. Again, melanotic neuroectodermal tumor of infancy, osteoidosteoma, and plasmacytoma were all moved into their respective categories elsewhere in the book. And then there was a significant reorganization with the concept of going from benign to malignant within all of the various um, categories of odontogenic uh, carcinomas and osteosarcomas, chondrosarcomas, etc. So when you think about it, the book has also had the um, ability to have several tables added. Here is an example of such a table just talking about what the radiographic findings are for these various lesions, separated out by their most common age at initial presentation based on decades of life. And you can see that there really is quite a remarkable variation of whether they are radiolucent, mixed radiolucent and radio-opaque, or whether they are just radio-opaque. Likewise, within this, um, some of the genetic pathways have been identified for a variety of different odontogenic lesions. Here you can see the giant cell lesions separated out by decades. So in other words, which decade are they the most commonly identified with and which gene has been seen most frequently within it. Likewise, the same thing has happened with the fibrosseous lesion category where each of the various uh, diagnostic entities has been separated out based on which genetic abnormality has been seen uh, within them, or at least identified thus far. And finally, between the bone and cartilaginous tumors, whether the benign lesions or the malignant lesions, you can tell which of the various mo uh, molecular um, pathways have been identified or the specific gene or mutation has been documented and allows for a very easy way to look at um, how there is some remarkable overlap between these particular entities. So these type of graphs are very helpful within the book in order to be able to give a better classification system. So let's talk about surgical ciliated cyst. It's actually just an implantation phenomenon, if you will, where the person has some traumatic event related to either surgery or trauma, and um, there's a displacement of respiratory type epithelium, usually showing this very well demarcated appearance radiographically. And then, of course, it's lined by just normal respiratory type epithelium, and therefore goblet cells are quite frequently identified in this lesion. The adenoid ameloblastoma is a new example of an ameloblastoma category where it's partly cribriform in its architectural arrangement, showing uh, some reverse polarization, with only a very minor component of stellate reticulum being able to be identified. The basal cells very frequently are multi-layered, transitioning to a round or ovoid morphology with some duct-like structures present, and of course about two-thirds of the cases will have some appearance of dentinoid-type material within them. 
Segmental odontomaxillary dysplasia has been included as well because this is a non-hereditary but still unilateral developmental disorder characterized by both um, maxillary uh, bone as well as soft tissue involvement by a um, homolateral cutaneous manifestation seen in some of the cases as well. So radiographically, there's usually a periapical or poorly defined area of abnormal bone, as you can see in this radiograph, representing what is seen in the patient above, where there is an overgrowth of these um, uh, soft tissue related elements. Very rarely is uh, a sample taken, but when it does, the bone biopsies will reveal some irregular bone spicules and of course, accentuated reversal uh, lines in the bone. This is um, again, an entity that is included because of its tumor-like presentation, um, both radiographically as well as clinically. I think this is one of the most significant additions is the TFCP2 rearranged rhabdomyosarcoma. As you know, it's a high-grade rhabdomyosarcoma showing a spindle cell morphology most regularly, with the majority of the patients being young at initial presentation. And because they arise within the bone uh, especially, and the craniofacial bones specifically with the mandible, maxilla, and skull bones is why it's being presented uh, in this chapter. There's often a biphasic appearance with a spindle to epithelioid areas, but it is also important to recognize that pure types can be seen of either pure spindle or pure epithelioid type appearance. Very monotonous, conspicuous nuclei, usually mitotic activity and tumor necrosis, and then it has an unusual immunophenotype of expressing both epithelial markers such as AE1, AE3, along with Desmond, Myogenin, and uh, MyoD1, with the MyoD1 much more strongly positive. And then finally, ALK is also presented. So you can tell that if you're just doing a very narrow focused um, immunohistochemical panel, you're likely to get the wrong diagnosis unless you expand it to include several other lesions within the diagnostic category. Here is such an example where you can see the surface epithelium um, overlying is not dysplastic, and that's one of the key features, because I think it is difficult to tell where the surface epithelium ends and the underlying spindle cell morphology appears. When you look at it on high power, you can see that there is a plasmacytoid to epithelioid type appearance, but still showing a, a spindle cell morphology with easily identified uh, mitotic figures, including um, atypical forms, as you can see in the center over here. Um, by immunophenotype, as I've already suggested, it has this cross-reactivity between epithelial markers such as AE1, AE3, with the myogenin, myoD1, as well as ALK being expressed in the tumor. So an important consideration, especially in a young person with a spindle cell lesion, we used to always say um, squamous cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, but now we also need to include the TFCP2 rearranged rhabdomyosarcoma category. Mucosal melanoma um, went from six different diagnoses to three in the 2017, and now is just one diagnosis because basically it's saying it can occur anywhere within the upper aerodigestive tract. About 20% of skin melanomas occur in the head and neck, but about 4% of them are mucosal in this location. So sunlight is a presumed non-factor. People will lie out in the sun and you can tell that um, the nose may be affected, sometimes even going into uh, tanning booths, the uh, UV exposure may be there, but in general, this is considered to be a not uh, a factor with formalin exposure, much more likely to be the case, especially in yourself as a person involved in the lab or being a pathologist. Radiation and geographic uh, location of residents can also play a factor. The mucosal melanoma is equal in the sexes, quite different from what you see in the cutaneous counterparts, and they also present at an older age at initial presentation, with the oral cavity and nasal cavity uh, much more likely affected. They tend to be uh, somewhat sizable, in other words, um, two to three centimeters in overall um, dimension. Uh, most of these polypoid lesions, sometimes there's a dark tumor to represent that there is melanin present within it. Surface ulceration is quite common. And because of the fragmentation, Breslow's thickness or Clark's level cannot be meaningfully determined or measured, and therefore just are not included in this area. So you will notice a MRI showing a very large destructive lesion, um, endoscopy view of a large polypoid mass affecting the nasal cavity. And on the gross inspection, you can tell that it is a darkly pigmented lesion affecting the septum, and in fact is in also destroying the cartilage of the adjacent septum. 
So if junctional activity or pagetoid spread is seen, it can kind of help to define the presence of um, a primary tumor, but just remember that stromal involvement alone is also quite commonly seen in this particular uh, category. Very, very wide histologic sp uh, spectrum, and uh, we always use the term protean for this, and so I've included an example of Proteus, the god of change, as he can present in any particular form he chooses. And with that in mind, you can have a variety of different patterns, from the paratheliomatous and epithelioid to solid fasciculus, storiform, papillary, alveolar, really there's anything, as well as a variety of different cytomorphologic appearances, ranging from round cell to spindled, polygonal, uh, giant cell, etc. If you do have involvement of the surface epithelium, here you can see multiple areas of pagetoid spread of the tumor as it has gone into the overlying surface. Here is an example of just a single highly atypical uh, melanocyte present at the junction, and there is overlying squamous metaplasia in this example. Clearly pigment is easily identified in this case, and so it would not be so challenging to come up with a diagnosis. But a spindle cell lesion such as this would probably be much more challenging to be able to reach a correct diagnostic interpretation. The small blue round cell category of neoplasm is brought to mind with this example of a melanoma, where it has a completely round cell morphology. Paratheliomatous distribution, where it wraps around the um, vessels and remains viable, another example here of a spindle cell tumor showing that same phenomenon, can be a helpful tip off to the underlying diagnosis that is present. However, the spindle cell morphology in fascicles uh, is seen here with a very prominent nucleolus seen in these examples can certainly suggest that um, a melanoma is present, but it is by no means specific for the diagnosis. As you know, there are a variety of different uh, mel melanocytic markers with SOX10 and S100 protein perhaps utilized most regularly, while HMB45, tyrosinase, melan-A, and even PRAME as the newest marker can certainly be um, utilized in this. Just be aware that there is usually remarkable phenotypic infidelity or anomalous immunoreactivity that can be seen in this tumor category. Within the mucosal site areas, uh, KRAS, I'm sorry, uh, NRAS and KIT mutations are much more frequently seen than the BRAF, and so this is quite different from those that can be seen in cutaneous anatomic sites. So here is an example of the SOX10. You can see a very strong and diffuse reaction in this round cell morphology, an S100 showing spindle cell melanoma positive in both the nucleus and the cytoplasm, while HMB45 and even melan-A can be expressed in these tumors. The new marker of PRIM gives you a very strong nuclear reaction in uh, melanocytes. However, there are some other tumor categories that can also be positive. So even already, this is not quite as, spe as specific as it was originally thought to be. Germ cell tumors in the head and neck actually were aggregated into a single location basically considering teratoma to be a benign lesion arise from, arising from all three germ cell layers, while the extragonadal malignant germ cell tumor category encompasses really any of the spectrum of tumors that can be seen in uh, the gonads. So specifically uh, for the malignant germ cell tumors, yolk sac tumor is by far and away the most common, but it is also important to recognize that SMARC-B1 or SMARC-A4 deficient carcinomas and even teratocarcinosarcoma um, can be um, uh, seen with uh, various uh, components that can uh, mimic yolk sac tumor. So it is important to exclude those particular entities. And then of course, also excluding that it does not represent metastatic disease is a significant observation. When one considers metastases to the head and neck, I think this is a very important thing to consider as well. It was not included at all in the 2017, but now is under one diagnostic chapter, which really just says they must be tumors that have arisen elsewhere and have resulted by either lymphatic or vascular spread into one of the lymph nodes or soft tissues bone of the area. So they are divided into anatomic site. And as you can tell, one of the tables there, and I'll show you this in a two slide, um, a two-part slide here, divided by anatomic site with the most common metastatic malignancies identified and what relevant immunohistochemical markers can be performed in order to make a separation between them. And you can tell this is a very extensive documentation of the most common and frequently seen of the tumors and allowing you to be able to come up with a meaningful separation between them. 
recognizing, of course, that always it can be that uh, lineage infidelity or immunophenotypic overlap can be seen within any of these lesions and therefore should not just be relied upon uh, on its own. So here is an example of a uh, metastatic uh, prostate carcinoma giving you a very nonspecific glandular appearance, but of course here the NKX 3.1 is strongly positive. And an example here of an oxophilic uh, pattern to a renal cell carcinoma showing a very nice PAX8 immunoreactivity in this case. So clearly immuno can be utilized in order to be able to reach the correct interpretation of these lesions. Finally, I'd like to end with the genetic tumor syndromes. And you can see that um, a couple were presented in 2005 with one lesion presented in the 2017 edition, but this is the first time that there has been a chapter devoted specifically to the entire group of genetic tumor syndromes in which the head and neck has the major manifestations. So it's trying to establish associated findings and disorders, giving recommendations for how to monitor as well as how to treat these particular lesions, while giving very specific uh, presentation of careful family documentation, DNA sequencing aids in order to be able to reach the classification, and recognizing that sporadic tumors are becoming less and less and more likely they are part of a syndrome association. And this, I think, is a meaningful representation. Just to let you know, there will, in fact, be a familial tumor syndromes book that is going to come out as the final uh, entity within the fifth series. Uh, where an entire tumor classification will be presented in that fashion. So just as a single example, of course, all of us are familiar with uh, Gorlin syndrome or the neboid basal cell carcinoma syndrome, originally described actually in 1894 and then recognized as an entity in 1959 as an autosomal dominant associated specifically with a sonic hedgehog pathway. So what has been attempted is the major criteria are listed, minor criteria are presented, um, both histologically as well as clinically, and then what the parameters are that need to be documented in order to reach an actual interpretation. So here you can see a young uh, child with innumerable basal cell carcinomas affecting the face and chest, the palmar and plantar pitting that is so characteristic of the lesion, uh, presentation of a medulloblastoma on the left-hand side, and calcification of the falx on the right, and then, of course, uh, within the head and neck area for this multifocal or multiple um, odontogenic keratosis, as you can see, diagrammatically re represented and then showing uh, multiple lesions in the uh, panoramic view. Classical appearance of the um, odontogenic keratosis with areas of subepithelial clefting, uh, basal palisade, and the hyperrefractile area of perikeratin that is seen at the surface, and also recognizing that these daughter cysts that can be seen present in the deep stroma are one of the most characteristic findings when one sees uh, evidence of a syndrome association. So with that, I would like to end and thank you very much for listening to this particular presentation of some of the updates from the World Health Organization classification of tumors.